So welcome to today's Liber Arts Club with Ian and me. Um, the, today is uh, I'm going to do an overview of Biconductor. Um, a lot of it is about the Biconductor.org website. Uh, so let me share my screen. Um, as a reminder, Zoom has this utilities where you can use the um, if you go to the Zoom window and see the participants, um, there you can like uh, say yes or no, um, uh, click on go slower, go faster, or raise your hand type of thing. Um, and in theory, I should get a little prompt. That way I can um, know you have any questions, stuff like that. Um, let me just rearrange my windows. In my computer a little bit so I can see this. Cool. Um, so um, from the um, from the Google group that we created this past week, um, if you have access to it. Um, 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 if you have access to it over here, there's a link called History of Sessions. Um, that link opens this Google spreadsheet where we have the meeting li uh, Zoom links, um, the titles of the topics, and some materials and stuff like that. So from here, if you could open the Bioconductor Overview Slides Material uh, Google Doc on your computer, that would be great. That way you can follow um what we're doing um all right so i have a lot of notes for today a lot of links um just because i want to make sure i didn't forget some things i wanted to to show to you um uh, at some point we might um um do some um, um, R code, but today it mostly won't be about R code. Uh, but if you want, you can open your R and then run this little function. Um, install the packages, open parentheses, open quotes, BIOC manager with capital B and capital M. Uh, but today is not a really, it's, we're not really focusing on code. So, um, Um, so, um, we already saw, I think last session or two sessions ago, we, we talked about R and why R has been really popular. Um, and one of the main reasons why R has been popular, um, uh, is that, um, it's free and it's open source. Plus it's easy to expand. How you expand R? Um, that's true uh, making a, uh, something called an R package, which is a collection of files um, that uh, you can share with other people. Now, CRAN, um, the website, we typically refer to it as the location where you get um, R, right? If I open this link over here, um, um, he has links on how to download and install R for Linux, Mac, and Windows, et cetera. Um, um, now, uh, CRAN itself is not also just the location where we get R from. Um, it's also uh, an R package repository. So repository really here just means a, a location where people um, uh, deposit the code that they want to share with other users. Um, each repository has its own set of rules about uh, what type of files or what type of packages are allowed to be shared there. Now, inside CRAN on the left side, you'll find the task views. The task views is uh, a way of trying to, um, a way by CRAN to try to organize the thousands of packages that they have. And there's like 
for example, one for reproducible research. And there's a particular maintainer. Actually, there's two. Uh, John, um, uh, when I mispronounce his last name, uh, Lishak, then Allison Hill. Um, Allison Hill actually works at our studio. She's a great person to if you ever meet her. Um, and so this is a location that people like try to summarize the different packages that exist and what they can do, right? And why you might be interested in them. Um, so that's one location where you can find our packages that uh, you know might be helpful for something you need to do. Um, uh, but uh, there's something else called Bioconductor, which really is the um, R package repository. And um, as it's described on the website, it's for the analysis and comprehension of high throughput genomic data. Uh, this was born in academia. Um, it was born by um, different faculty in, uh, uh, in genomics, or really at the time it was a lot of microarrays um, um, interested in, um, in making high quality software. Um, and so they got together and created this repository. And they wanted to have some specific rules that cramped the CRAN, the R package over here, repository didn't want to have. Um, and so they wanted to do, you know, to provide this, basically a label that said like, okay, a packaging bioconductor meets these specific standards um, and it has um, basically its seal of approval for people to use. Now the website bioconductor.org has a ton of links and we're not even going to look at all of them. There's many. Um, there's a lot of places where you can find information and easily get lost. Um, so, or here the very short about says like, oh, it's tools for analysis and comprehension of high throughput genomic data. Right. So that's why, because there's so many links and things like that, um, I that's why I you know made a kind of a cheat sheet over here um, about what we'll be doing today. So the first thing I wanted to show is once you log into bioconductor.org, um, um, uh, I'm just gonna move this to the left so we can see where we are, All right? Um, so uh, right now I'm gonna uh, talk about the about page. So if you go to bioconductor.org, at the very top, there's a little, uh, there's a about here, right? So we click on that. Um, we get this, um, uh, you know, this uh, long block of text, although <laughs> it's being highly created to be as short as possible, <laughs> as specific as possible. But, um, but this explains a lot of what Bioconductor is. Um, now, uh, there's a couple of main references. So Biconductor itself is, um, has been historically funded by, I think, R01 grants uh, to NIH. Um, and so, as, you know, when you get, you know, get, get grants, you want to also publish papers type of thing. Um, and so there have two papers. There's an original one from 2004 uh, published in Genome Biology. And then there's a much newer one in 2015 from Nature Methods. Um, you should be able to access both of them for free. There's also a 2005 book, um, which if you wanted to, I have it at Lieber. I have a, I have a paper copy of this one. Um, um, and so this, I'm showing this book because uh, the people that made the book um, over here, please. Um, are actually some of the uh, Bioconductor founders, really. So one of them is Robert Gentleman. Can you click yes if you know who he is and no if you don't? Just to make it a little bit dynamic. I see one no so far. Two no's. Three no's. Anyone else? Mm. 
So if you, um, you want to find where you can vote, you need on the Zoom, on your Zoom window, you click on participants, there you can find these little buttons to vote and stuff. I see five no's. No one really knows Robert Gentleman. Seven no's, one yes. Ooh. All right. Uh, eight notes. Okay. All right. So let me sidetrack a little bit. Because uh, I, I mean, I was going to talk about him, but I was going to talk about him a lot later. Uh, where is that? Um, 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 I can't remember where I put the link. All right. It wasn't. It wasn't that far away. Um, so, Robert Gentleman uh, is one of the two people that wrote the R language. Um, the other person is uh, his name is Ross Ihaka. Um, both of their first names start with R. R is based on the S language. Um, so. There's always been all these different ideas of why it was called R um, uh, and not something else. But yeah, so Robert, um, uh, he created uh, R uh, with uh, Ross Ihaka. But then um, he was a faculty at Harvard University and he saw the opportunity to create um, a repository for um, you know, high throughput analysis. And that's where he created Bioconductor. Uh, Bioconductor was originally um, um, which is a project he did, um, and it's grown quite a bit. Um, and last year, the Bioconductor 2019 conference, uh, because it was his sixth birthday, it was a special symposium day about everything that he's done for R and the community. I think you say that. Um, um, uh, and like uh, in my own personal case, uh, uh, like the first time I went to a Bioconductor conference in 2008, he was really friendly with me and I had no idea who he was. Uh, so he, he gave me some books to get started. <laughs> um, um, here's a photo of us with him uh, at the recent conference. That's Robert. He now works um, after um, Bioconductor, he uh, was recruited by Genentech. And then from Genentech, he moved to 23andMe. Um, so uh, he doesn't, maintain he's a lot more interested in research um uh, uh and uh um uh, doesn't um he no, he's no longer the head of the bioconductor project and so uh, he's uh not as interested anymore in maintaining our packages he's more interested in in, uh, in solving questions um so that's robert vince carey is also faculty at harvard Wolfgang Huber, uh, he's from the uh, Embel in Heidelberg, Germany. Raphael Lizari, he used to be at Hopkins, he's now at Harvard. And Sandrine Dubois is a um, biostatistics faculty at, um, um, at Berkeley. And so these are really the core like uh, academic uh, individuals that, uh, that created Bioconductor. Um, and so they wrote a book about it. Uh, but this is from 2005, and like, uh, unless you want to do microarray stuff, you can't. Like, there's nothing really um, that useful there anymore. Um, okay. Um, so those are the people that created Bioconductor, um, uh, and currently it's organized across um, uh, a couple teams and uh, and scientific board. Or I mean, and different boards. There's the core team. And I'm highlighting this, um, I'm highlighting the people because um, uh, these are really the people that will help you at some point and will make things, will make sure that things work. So Bioconductor, the core team, uh, Bioconductor itself, uh, Martin Morgan, the project lead, he works at a place in, in Toronto now called uh, the Roswell, um, uh, Roswell Park uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, that's where he works. And so they've hired a couple of people that they maintain with them, their grant, but there's also several people that um, are really important that are not necessarily uh, paid by Bioconductor. One of them, for example, is Michael Lawrence. He now works at Genentech. Mike Smith, I, I think he's in the UK. Um, 
Nitesh, uh, for those of you that were yesterday at the James Taylor Memorial, Nitesh uh, used to work with uh, James Taylor here at, Har at um, Hopkins. Um, so these are the people that will help you uh, if you get stuck at some point. Um, it's also one of the reasons why the Bioconductor Project works because there's people that um, are paid um, to do this as their, as their main job, to maintain it, right? Um, instead of just being volunteers. Uh, which is a, a difference uh, compared to CRAN. CRAN is mostly volunteers. Um, and so uh, uh, having people that will officially know how to help you and who can spend time helping you really makes it great for both users and developers. Um, Biconductor has a scientific board, which is really the people that kind of created it and have um, some big impact, have had a big impact on it. At different times, um, James Taylor was part of the scientific board, um, um, and like there's people like Jenny Bryan from our studio, things like that, or Robert himself. Um, um, there's the technical board, advisory board, which is has a lot of faculty that you might know already. For example, Stephanie Hicks, who is a friend of ours at the uh, Department of Biostatistics. And Casper Daniel Hansen, also from Biostatistics, they are part of the technically advi uh, technical advisory board. Aaron Loon, for example, that we use a lot of his code. Um, people like that. Um, 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 and then I'm, I was recently elected into the community advisory board, which they just created in April 2020. So there you can find me. Um, and other people that like to like to teach about bioconductor to other people. Um, um, so this involves me. I have a meeting uh, one Thursday every week, every month, uh, where I have to wake up at 7 a.m. <laughs> for the meeting. Because uh, we have people all over the world in this meeting. Um, so that's the people that make bioconductor run. Some people are paid. Uh, some of us from the community advisory board, we're not paid. Although there's a uh, potential for maybe getting paid to do some of the things we do for Bioconductor. Um, so that's really the people behind it um, and the papers that describe it. Now, let's say you actually want to use it. So Bioconductor, it's a repository, but it's actually a collection of four types of repositories of our packages. There's four um, you know, categories of what they accept. There's software packages, annotation, experiment data and workflow packages. Um, what are the differences between them? So, um, 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 so um, a software really is the main type of package that people contribute to Biconductor. Um, that's, um, that type of package does a specific type of analysis and it will try to do it really well. And typically, there's a scientific publication tied to a particular um, software package. This is mostly, uh, mostly user-contributed. Um, um, now, there's also the annotation package, type of package. And the idea of this type of package was to make it easy for people to do analysis, genomic analysis. And so there's a lot of um, genomic databases out there that have very specific formats. Um, like a ton of them are like SQL databases. Um, and uh, in order to use them a lot is, you know, uh, you could always write the R code yourself to read them, to like do queries on these databases, to extract information you need. But to make it easier for all of us, the R, the Biconductor core team has made a lot of annotation packages. Um, and so the idea that is that this package is the interface with some genomic databases. Um, there's also the experiment data type of package. And, and this is a type of package that um, typically contains quite a bit of data, right? Um, software packages, they, they're uh, designed or they're in theory, they should be less than five megabytes big. So it's mostly just code. However, experiment data packages are like anything that's beyond that. Right? And so they, some of them can be several gigabytes big. Um, and the idea here is that you will put some data that's either related to a paper um, or, um, or data that you want to use as examples in one of your software packages. 
Um, this is also uh, typically uh, uh, mostly user contributed. Uh, the last type of type of package is called a workflow package. And the idea is that one of these packages shows how, you, how a user can, um, can uh, utilize several R and Biconductor packages together to do some type of analysis. So let's say you want to do RNA-seq differential expression. Right? Um, and so uh, this is a lot more about documentation. Um, and I'm trying to teach people uh, how to use all the tools that we've made, type of thing. Um, you know, um, if you have any questions at any point, just you know, use the raise hand feature so I know that you have questions. Um, all right. Um, now, now that we know there's four types of packages, you can browse them to different locations. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> the about page actually includes most of these links. Um, I'm just um, looking for the blue keywords here. So <clears throat> over here, for example, it says analysis packages. And so that's the same link I put on the, on the Google Doc. Um, uh, I clicked on the Zoom thing. Um, all right. um, analysis over here. So it's really a very simple table over here that has a link to the package, who maintains it, and what's the title for it. And there's tons of them. And so this is a really long um, uh, list, right? Um, it's not that uh, like user friendly. Similarly, we have lists like that, links, lists like that for all the other ones. The one that is really the shortest is the uh, workflows. Um, uh, workflows, there's not that many, so you can quickly look through all of them. Um, and this might be where you want to get started um, if you're a new user, um, um, potentially. Uh, we'll, we'll circle back to workflows. Um, so I made several packages. I've actually have made uh, now um, every type of package, uh, software annotation, experiment, and workflow packages. So uh, uh, I, you know, I started just doing software packages, but now I've had to do a couple of the other ones. Um, um, and um, if you ever want to make any of them, I can help you. Um, now. We saw that those lists are not really that user friendly to explore. So I'm gonna go back uh, to the bikeconductor.org website. Uh, and in the main uh, uh, landing page, there's four little boxes in the middle. One of them has the install header. And it says here, discover uh, uh, 1900 packages, software packages. So if I click on that, um, it opens um, in, this takes a tiny bit of time because it needs to download um, some data and have my browser uh, displayed. But what it opens is this uh, um, page called the BioC views. The BioC views, the name of it, um, it's, um, I don't know if any of you noticed, but the name of it is kind of a play with the CRAN views, right? CRAN has the task views, Conductor has a bio CVs. Um, so it's born from you know the same type of idea of let's have a category for packages, right? Like um, like labels for what they uh, what they belong to. Um, and it really is uh, the bio CVs is really like four different trees. There's one for software, one for annotation data, one for experiment data, and one for workflow. Um, so you have all these, you know, you have four trees. Um, each of them has different branches, right? And you can get into smaller and smaller branches. And the idea is that uh, uh, the package author can label um, their package with as many of those little branches as they want. Um, and they could be, um, they could not come from the same, it doesn't have to be uh, smaller branches from the same big branch. It can be like across the whole tree. And the idea of this is to make it easier for people to find something that uh, they might need. 
So if we're looking at software, it's a 1903, now there's 1904. There's already a new one. Um, and so you can click on, on any of these broad categories to keep navigating the tree. So for example, if I click on workflow step, uh, there's a thousand packages out of the 1900 software packages that have, um, um, have workflow step. And inside of them, I can click on visualization. And visualization has 486 packages. So I'm gonna click over here. And I'm clicking on visualization just to tie it into what we did last week, which was like um, learning about flooding with R. And so again, you get this, uh, this like table of like, um, what's the package name, the maintainer, and the title. It has a new little column called rank, which the rank is based on the number of downloads for that particular package. And so they added this as a way of like telling people like, oh, maybe you wanna just use uh, one of the mostly downloaded packages. Um, um, but it also has a search a box over here. Um, so for example, maybe you want something that has to do with uh, gene ontologies. So you can type geo and that reduces the list to just 38 packages here um, that you can look at. Uh, maybe not all of them are related to gene ontologies, but like that's um, that's um, a quicker way of finding packages that you might want to use. Um, so, um, so we just did all of this over here, where we got to the visualization packages. Now, let's say you found found a package that you want to work with. So, um, um, Biconductor has this nice. Um, uh, URL redirecting uh, structure where you type bioconductor bioconductor.org slash forward slash packages forward slash um, any package name with the exact same spelling. Um, it will redirect you to the landing page for a package. So for example, here I want to go to uh, recount. So that's bioconductor.org slash packages slash recount. And it automatically redirected me to um, to the actual like uh, website over here. Um, this is one of my packages, um, and so that's why I'm like just showing it over here. But this is a very similar structure for other packages. So, for example, we can look at summarize experiment. Um, so, really, uh, I'm, on my Mac computer, I have something called. Um, uh, um, uh, Alfred, and Alfred lets me uh, create uh, queries to specific URLs. So this is really my short version of typing on the browser, biconductor.org uh, slash packages slash a package name. You can see briefly here that it, um, that's what it typed. Um, so this is also another uh, another package that will, um, another package landing page. So let me go back to the recount one and explain what you can see over here. So at the very top, you find the package name. Um, I mean, you also see the Biconductor version that this package is tied to. I'll talk about Biconductor versions um, a bit later. So we have recount, that's the name of the package. And we have a, uh, seven badges. Um, these badges, the idea of them is that um, a user can look at them fairly quickly and get, um, get uh, an idea of like, okay, is this, does this seem like a good package for me to use? And good has, you know, many different ways of being um, evaluated. Um, there's one over here that says like how many, how long has this package been in Biconductor? So Recount has been in Biconductor for three and a half years. Um, so uh, you know that like at least for three and a half years, the author of this package has made sure that it keeps working. Um, it also has this uh, um, list to the support website, which uh, shows how many uh, questions there are in on average per month, um, the number of uh, answers um, in average per question, um, the number of comments in average, and, um, and I forget what's the fourth number. Um, so that questions, answers per question, comments per question. Um, yeah, I forget what the fourth number is, but um, the idea is, is that this is green. It seems like the package author is responding to any questions people ask about this package. 
you can also see the rank, which is like you know uh, how downloaded this package is, um, uh, and um, what it seems to be working on on uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, so that's a bit of information you, as the user, might you know check, but maybe you, maybe you don't really care about any of this. Maybe you really need to use the package. Um, there's also a digital digital object. Uh, a digital object identifier POI for the package um, itself. So it might not have a, a, a paper, but it already has a POI. Okay, next you, have the, next you get the title. The title is a thing that was uh, already used in the BIOS reviews, but you also get a little short paragraph that explains in a bit more words what this package is supposed to do. After that, you get the list of authors but also you get the information about how to cite that package. Some of them have more information, like this recount one. Uh, other ones have less, like for example, the summarized experiment. Um, doesn't really have a paper tied to it. Um, uh, we scroll further down, we can find the installation instructions, uh, instructions to install this package. So it says like, okay, you need our version 4.0 for this particular version of recount. And it gives you the R code that you can quickly copy paste uh, to install the package. Um, now, <clears throat> it also uh, has this documentation tab over here. Um, the documentation has either HTML or PDF links, depending on the type of package. Uh, and these uh, links over here have very short titles. Um, but these links are for what's called a vignette. Now, let me just open one of them, the recount quick start guide. I'm going to open it in a new tab. Um, so, this is the main thing you want to look at uh, uh, the vignettes. The vignettes is where the package authors have tried to explain um, how you can use the functions for this particular package. Um, I like to actually start with like some like reminders of how you can install it, some links to maybe um, other packages you might need to understand before using this particular package, how to ask for help, and, and like how to cite it. This is a structure that I use in all my packages. But then here, for example, there's a very quick short guide of like, this is how you use the different functions for this package, and this is like what you would get, right? Um, uh, uh, that's the one for recount um, and you know there's it's, uh, it's quite long as it's a pretty uh, long manual um, summarize experiment and it has actually two different vignettes they actually have numbers here so you can um, uh, you can um, you know what the order for them is uh, and so for example here i'm opening the, um, the first vignette and they you know introduce what the problem is they tell you what this package does um, um, I got a Slack notification, uh, which I won't see right now. Um, and you might have images, you might have different outputs there. Yeah, doing a quick Slack. Um, um, all right. So, vignettes is where you want to go because that's where. Uh, uh, you can see how the different functions of the particular package work together and in what order. And, uh, and then you get uh, more text written by the, and images written by the uh, package authors explaining how these functions are, um, you know, play with each other. Um, and that's, you know, that's the main documentation you want to see. Once you found a package that you're inter interested in, that's where you want to look at. Um, I also typically, um, I mean, I look at the badges, but I also look at the vignettes fairly quickly. And if the vignette seems like it's um, uh, fairly uh, short uh, and, um, and not really uh, carefully written, uh, or I mean, sorry, not, uh, it's not about being carefully written, but it feels like it's, it, it was something they just threw together to, you know, to try to, um, to, to get their package accepted uh, by like um, meeting, meeting the minimum requirements, then I'm like, eh, I'm not so sure about this package. Um, uh, there's people that, you know, do that. Um, 
Um, and so unlike CRAN packages, every bioconductor package has to have at least one vignette. That's one of the requirements. And it's something that um, bioconductor uh, reviewers will look at. Um, the code also gets tested. Now, um, uh, if, we, if I go back to recount, under the details over here, you find a, um, quite a bit of information that it gets packed and you might not, um, if you're uh, um, just uh, browsing for the first time, you might miss. But it has, for example, the bio C views. It has all these different tags of where it belongs in that tree. Um, it has links to all the packages this particular R package uses. So all the imports linking to suggests uh, the packages that actually use this. So it depends on me, imports me, suggests me. Oh, I didn't know. Okay, there's a couple of new packages I didn't know uh, that use recount. Um, uh, so you can see how this package is related to other ones fairly quickly. But also it has this URL, which is um, where you can find the code for the particular R package, um, typically. Um, also the bug reports, is where, which, which is where you can ask for help for a particular package. Um, if you go to package archives, there's a lot more details that you might not want to check, except maybe the download statistics. Um, for example, you get a little report of how many people actually download um, you know, the package. So recount in 2019 has 8,000 downloads um, coming from 3,500 unique um, computers. Um, right. um, okay, so as you see, there's a lot of information in each um, um, R package, um, Biconductor package landing page. Um, a lot of it can be really useful. It's just that uh, if you just look at this, it doesn't really explain to you that much what each section is uh, showing. Um, and uh, um, uh, it's easy to miss that maybe the information that you wanted was already here. All right. <clears throat> so, so Bioconductor, has this very specific structure. There's, um, it has always two branches of bioconductor. One is called the release, and one of, one of them is called devel. Devel is short for development. And so the idea is that there's always a version that is um, well tested and that uh, anyone should be able to use um, on their computers. All the users, this is really the, the version that we expect users to be able to use. Uh, and it's always the latest. Um, for example, Andrew and other people, they frequently ask me, should we, should we really up upgrade R? And I'm always like, yes, because people have put a lot of work into making sure that the release version of the package, you know, has solved as many bugs as they found over time. Now, the development branch of a bioconductor package, that's where developers get to, is their playground, really. It's where you can try to make new stuff. Um, try to get it tested uh, and, make, and you have six months to try to do this before it's shared to the users, right? Um, um, and so uh, you want to be able to keep upgrading your, your R package, uh, um, uh, make, making sure that uh, you satisfy your users type of thing. Now, these two branches, they're on a six month cycle. Um, um, they always like uh, bump numbers every six months on April and October of each year. Um, this is because R gets updated every year in April. So for example, there's a, or, uh, or March really, yeah, April, we're already in May, right? Yeah, we're already in May. Um, sorry, so um, R 4.0 was released in April of this year um, and Bioconductor 3.11 was also just released, actually it was released this week um, um, uh, at the end of April. So the fact that there's two branches that shouldn't really affect most users, except if you are really on the cutting edge. And so for example, today, um, Matt and I um, and others had a meeting and uh, we requested a change to one of the bioconductor packages. 
And if they make that change, it would only be available in the development version, um, most likely. Uh, so Matt and I will need to, um, you know, make sure we can run our repo. I mean, by conductor repo. Um, um, okay. Now, if I scroll all the way up to the landing page, there was one of these badges called build, and it says OK in green. And that's because um, if I open that link in a new tab, every single day, software packages in Biconductor get tested on Linux, Windows, and Mac for both the release and the development branches. So this is also something really different to CRAN. CRAN only tests a package the moment a person uploads it to CRAN. Biconductor tests, it, tests the package daily with the latest stuff. And so the developer of the package will know immediately if something is not working and um, they can try to fix it as fast as possible before any users run into the problem. Um, so there's actually a bunch of steps here that get tested in each of these computers. Um, and so this is, for example, level one for release. So let me go to the develop version. Um, and actually in the development, I have a problem on Linux that I need to fix for recount. Um, uh, so maybe I'll do that after this. Uh, um, okay. Um, now, um, that was maybe a little bit too like technical. But something that, uh, that uh, uh, you, as a user you can see is if I go to the bioconductor.org main website, uh, on the very left side under the news, it says Bioconductor 3.11 is available. I'm gonna click on that link and open it into new tab. Uh, well, I guess I open it into new window. Um, um, and this link over here is a summary of everything that is new on this six month cycle. So it was April 28th. Um, uh, there's actually 98 new software packages, 10 new data, five new annotation, one new workflow, and a bunch of different things that were released this week. Um, now, this is something that I really like to um, go through. Uh, I haven't had the time to do it right now, but I like to go through each of them because what it shows is it shows the package name and it shows that short paragraph description that uh, a package authors wrote about the package. And so I like to go through all of these. I'll open many of them, um, check a lot of the landing pages. I'll check those badges. I'll check that uh, vignette type of thing to just find packages that you know people have made and that might be easy for you know of interest for me to use. Um, we actually did this as an art club activity uh, in the R Stats Club in 2018, November 2018. Um, and um, we wrote a little blog post. And this was for version 3.8 of Bioconductor. Uh, we, we wrote a little blog post uh, saying why some of these packages could be of interest to us. Um, actually, I don't think we used many of them. Um, we do use some of them, but not many of the ones that got highlighted here. Um, these were just um, our packages that were like, oh, you know, maybe we, maybe we want to use this. Um, so this is where um, I like to look to try to stay updated. Um, I don't look at every single one of them, um, but I do try to look at some of them. Um, and so this is where you can look at for anything new if you're trying to stay on the uh, on the latest. Um, now let's say you're starting, right? And so if I go, we go back to bioconductor.org and we scroll down at the bottom of the website, there's this events page. So I'm gonna open that in a new tab. Um, events. So events here is where you can find upcoming and, uh, and conferences or workshops related to Bioconductor, as well as all the previous ones throughout the years. Uh, so there's many of them. Um, back to 2010, um, at least on this little website. Um, so if I go back to the top, the very main one that Bioconductor hosts, and this is my favorite conference, uh, is the BioC conference. Um, I've been to it 
um, the most in my life. I've been to it seven times uh, already. And this is what the conference where I learned how to use R and then how to use Biconductor and stuff. Although this year it might be remote, but um, if you, I highly recommend that you sign up, all of you, uh, to this conference. Um, it's a two day um, conference with a third day uh, that is for developers type of thing, but you can also, you're uh, more than welcome to join. I actually, I'm organizing one in Mexico also. So this is a link to the one I'm organizing. Um, um, and so these conferences are great. Um, they try to have each year one in the US, one in Europe type of thing. Um, um, to, uh, and now recently uh, there's people that are organizing one in Asia. And then I'm organizing one in Mexico um, to like smaller, like to a much smaller extent, right? Um, but this is where we, Bioconductor at its, um, at its core has a mandate to try to teach people uh, how to use these tools. Um, now, uh, uh, sorry, under the events page, there's a separate link called course material. And this one is, can be really useful for people that, uh, that are starting because you can find links and slides and materials to a lot of past uh, workshops. Um, one of the ones um, that I like is this link over here um, uh, that I have on the Google Lab for the Bioconductor 2019 workshops. So everyone that taught a little workshop on the conference last year had to make um, how to make a little chapter for this book. Um, and if you click on any of them, so I'm gonna open the one I made, if I can find it. Um, here, using recount too. Um, so uh, each of them has like, can have images, can have code, um, and you can copy paste that code and it, it should work, um, or at least it did work back, uh, back in last year. Um, so you can see a lot of things. Um, so um, you can learn from here, um, but that's just one conference. People organize multiple conferences and share materials all over the place. Um, there's also like a Bioconductor developer, develop, Developers Forum that meets um, uh, once every month on Thursdays. And so for example, here you can have some YouTube videos to those meetings. Um, now, uh, Bioconductor also is a community. Uh, and so uh, there is a Bioconductor Slack. Uh, let me just open my Slack again. Mm -hmm. uh, Bioconductor has a, a Slack that anyone can join um, from users to developers. Um, I think it has nearly 700 people on it. Um, and there's many different cha uh, channels where you can ask uh, or I mean, you can learn things. Um, uh, you can, you know, uh, share your opinion about where the project should go in this particular that area. For example, there's a channel for spatial um, methods uh, for um, uh, spatial genomics, um, and so uh, recently that's where we've been talking about the package we made over here at Lear for our spatial data, um, and other uh, people were interested in asking questions about it. Um, now from bioconductor.org itself, uh, there's a support website. So this is potentially the place where you might end up asking questions. Now, in a way you guys are lucky because there's other people around you that can ask questions more directly. Uh, but if uh, eventually at some point, either, uh, either uh, uh, you know, maybe they don't know the answer or, um, or you wanna ask more broadly your question, this is where you would go to Bioconductor, uh, the support website, which is support.bioconductor.org. Um, and uh, when you ask a question over here, you can use, um, I'm gonna click on this button. You can use a tag. And the idea of the tag is that you tag the particular R package that, um, that you're, uh, the recount, sorry, the, the Bioconductor package that you're asking a question about. So for example, here I can say, I'm gonna tag the recount package. Why you wanna do that? Because um, um, let me go to a particular tag for recount. 
um, you want to do this because um, that way the package maintainer gets um, gets an automatic email saying there's a new question, uh, but also because then it enables um, grouping all the uh, questions for a particular package together. So for example, these are all the questions people have asked about recon publicly here. Um, and, uh, uh, um, and so uh, whenever someone asks a question, they can put some code, can answer it, people can um, vote up the answer if they like it or not. Um, um, so like, these are just showing you like questions that I've asked uh, sorry, answer in the past for different users, um, things like that. Um, so that's a support website. Um, there's also Twitter, um, and Twitter is where you can find some more announcements. Uh, uh, people post them also on the bioconductor.org, uh, sorry, the support website um, uh, as announcements. Um, how do I go back to the phone? Um, so you can find some announcements over here, but like, um, um, so for example here, it has a news tag, uh, all these announcements. Uh, but you might also be interested in, in just looking at Twitter, uh, what people share there. If you're actually a developer or interested in becoming a developer, uh, the website bioconductor.org has a little tab over here for developers um, or at the top also developers. And I won't get into that uh, much um, uh, um, today, but this is where uh, developers can get access to the developers mailing list. And anyone can actually access this if you're interested in, in like uh, in like getting um, all the insights about like um, developers asking questions about themselves, about how do I do this, how do I do that, or um, um, so you'll find me there asking questions. Uh, um, uh, how to do Git uh, source control, uh, information about Docker, um, about the um, Amazon uh, images, um, and things like that for Bioconductor. Um, cool. So that's uh, nearly all I had. Um, and I missed an earlier link that I mentioned over here uh, on our notes which is a blog post that I wrote in 2014, um, trying to uh, answer the question, where they start using Biconductor? Um, um, and so you got a lot more of a detailed version than the one that I have on this blog post, uh, but it, um, uh, it has some of these tips that I shared. And basically a lot of these links from 2014 are still the same ones uh, today. Uh, um, Oh, so um, I'm going to stop recording. Mm -hmm.